Welcome to the Business Leader Spotlight. The Business Leader Spotlight is bringing attention to those in our community making a difference in business. It is also an opportunity to identify the skills they have learned and applied to get where they are. And now, let us go into this week's interview. Welcome to the Business Leader Spotlight. Thank you for joining us today. Today we have our guest, J.C. Moore, who is the Bowtie House Hunter. Welcome to the show, J.C. How are you doing today? Doing great, Mike. How about you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I know you've got a busy schedule. You've got a lot going on. And thank you for taking the time out to spend 30 minutes with us and talk. Absolutely. Appreciate the opportunity. Oh, so if you don't mind, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the things you're currently working on? Sure. Um, I'm a local realtor also a local car salesman, Um, but I work primarily in kind of the North Triangle, which would include Youngsville, Roseville, Wake Forest, anything kind of north of Raleigh and Durham, Um, touching on North North Raleigh and Durham. Currently working on a couple of projects, um, one of which being uh, affordable housing, as you've seen in most of the market around here. Mm -hmm. uh, The price for housing has gone up pretty substantially. And so I'm working with a couple of developers or aspiring developers um, to kind of create communities where the houses will be a little bit more affordable, a little bit more obtainable for those who look to obtain home ownership and are currently renting. Oh, wow. So do you mind me asking, how'd you get involved with um, the, the affordable housing piece? I know that especially now it's a big big market and and has a lot of opportunity available to it. It really kind of came around, came around organically. Um, Just having a conversation with some other agents, some, some, you know, aspiring developers. Mm -hmm. And we just really saw that need. Um, I saw that need in my own community, in my own church um, where, you know, I would run across people who want to become homeowners, but they just can't get that step because the price for average starter home in Wake County is enormous compared to where it is other places. And so just trying to fill that void for those that need it. Okay. Wow. That, that, that's great. You saw that opportunity and and being able to, to have the connections to know people to, to start down that line. It's good. Uh, You now, when you're talking about the, you know, I've, I've been in the, housing market here in Raleigh and, and trying to find the right house. And, and then you throw in that affordable piece, I guess, what are your, if you don't mind me asking a little bit more about this is that, what is it that you guys, in terms of the affordable pieces, are you looking to develop? Is it all single family homes? Are they like townhouses? What What's the, just the, you know, the, the overview of what it is that you're looking to um, start and develop? Absolutely. Um, we're starting with single family homes mm-hmm. um, because, of course, that's where the market is right now. And so trying to develop some of those. One of the developers I work with is trying to build homes of different materials. Like, okay. um, I don't know if you've ever seen container homes. Okay. Um, they build them out of the metal storage containers like you'd see on a shipping freighter. Um, you take one of those or a couple of those and you can stack them. You can design a home based on that floor plan and the materials are a lot easier to get. Now, the biggest problem we've run into thus far is some of the city ordinances don't let them, don't let you have them. And then the cities that do let you have them, we can start construction, but the banks don't like them yet. You know, it's kind of like when mobile homes first hit the market, you know, no banks wanted to touch them. Um, So it's kind of that same concept, but we saw where, we can build these homes for a fraction of the cost of what it costs to build a stick built home. Okay. Um, and it's sustainable. It's something that's going to last for presumably a long time. Right. So um, we're just working with kind of the, the hands that we have right now to develop that and kind of get those plans in motion. Um, I think we've already, I know one of the developers I work with has already gotten all the containers. Mm-hmm. We're sourcing land now. Um, and just kind of going through the permitting process. Um, 
the biggest thing right now, you know, somebody's going to have to do, or we're going to have to try to, we're working with some lenders to try to come up with some creative financing to be able to get these finance for people. So, I mean, they're affordable, but right. they have to have finance. I, most people who are renting don't have $65,000 to throw down on a house today. Right. Um, so it's just finding a way for them to be able to finance those. But, you know, realistically, when you look at it, you know, we're talking about homes that would be less than $100,000. Right. Um, where the average starter home in Raleigh right now is probably somewhere between the 250 to 300 mark. So, you know, coming in well below that to be able to give them that starter point and then eventually moving into some, you know, uh, multifamily units, mm -hmm. things like that, that would be able to be purchased. Wow. Um, so or at least giving them the option to be able to rent to purchase. Rent to purchase. Yeah. OK, yeah, that, mm -hmm. that sounds like it's a very exciting time. Uh, and usually with the excitement, there's the. The difficulties that come along uh, and you started to talk about them with uh, city ordinances and then lenders and, and, and the back and forth. And, and it seems like you guys are in a good position and, and you have a great plan in place. So that sounds like it's something exciting that that I want to keep my eye on because it it sounds like it can be very helpful to people that are looking to make that step into having purchasing their first home and it and it gives them an alternative option it doesn't necessarily be okay i have to go into this community over here and like you said you know step into the arena at 200 300 000 you know and basically i have to just work in order to be in this house or to be in to get into that house i have to just work myself you know till i'm old and gray just just to be able to live and, and have a place for my family so very exciting time uh, so real estate is, is, uh, something that I wanted to talk with you about as well. And how did you get your start or what was your start in real estate? So I got my start really, really young okay. in real estate. Um, my family, I come from one of those families where when someone passes, we don't let that house go. Okay. You know, um, my grandfather and my great uncles and they would all get together and they pull some money together and they buy that house and keep it in the family. Um, and so they did that and they started kind of developing a taste for it. And when I was in high school, my grandfather had about three different apartment buildings, mm -hmm. um, as well as some single family homes kind of around the Chicago land area. Well, one of my jobs was to go by, check on those homes, pick up rent checks, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I kind of developed a taste for it then. And then, uh, as I grew older, I rediscovered that passion for it. Okay. And I was like, you know, and sometimes things happen in your own life that kind of catapult you to this new level. Mm -hmm. And so when purchasing my own home, there were some things that were just left to be desired. And so I said to myself, if I can be that agent, if I can be that guy that fills those areas that need that I had of desire, then I could help other people. And so really for me, it just came from my love of being able to help people um, and just kind of organically grew from there. Well, that's interesting. Now, having that, that background uh, with the history, you know, with your family and being exposed to it at an early age, there's this in my mind, there's, it seems like there's this feast or famine type of environment when, when you go into the real estate market. It's almost like there's the haves and the have-nots of, of real estate uh, agents. D have you found that to be true for yourself or because of your background, you, you have – I know you have certain insights and certain understandings that somebody coming in fresh off the street may not have. But can you kind of describe that, that process as, in being able to go from that – feast or famine type of mindset? Absolutely. Um, I think any sales position is feast or famine to okay. some degree. Um, but in home sales, even though you've accomplished that sale and, you know, you get a client to, to sign off on a contract and, you know, everyone, all the parties are in agreement, you're still 30 to 45 days out at minimal. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still a lot of things that can go wrong. And so I think for me, the thing that's kept me sustainable is not just having one stream of income, um, you know, where I still do car sales. 
Um, so I'm still able to kind of fill that void. But I think anybody in any sales position has to have one, a budget, um, you know, a pretty outlined budget, right. because that's going to help you in those famine moments like we experienced earlier this year during COVID. Right. Um, but I also think that it takes a certain mindset to know that if I don't get out here and do what I got to do, then we're not going to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and it, if you've seen me, I like to eat. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a big boy. So, you know, I just have that desire to get out there and do it every day. Um, you know, doing something every day. And every day is a step, you know, I do something towards my business every day, regardless of how I feel, you know, whether it's just making a few phone calls and some emails, you know, and just really kind of keeping myself top of mind when it comes to the items that I sell. Okay. That that's interesting how you, you talk about taking the time, you know, one, the budgeting piece, because sometimes I know, budget is a dirty word for some people. It's like almost like restriction I can't do. Uh, and the other side was also you're doing something every day for the business, whether it's picking up the phone, making a phone call, you know, or whatever the, the process. It's It seems like you, you've gotten it down to the point where you understand that it's not, it's not just the sale. It's, it's, it's okay. What are all of the things that lead up to the sale that makes me successful that, you know, provides the opportunity so that I'm not in this basic famine type of mindset all the time. Is that correct? Oh, oh absolutely. Um, I would say even in the car business and in real estate, I'd say probably 80 to 90% of my business is referral. Um, and the only reason I get those is because one, I don't look at it as just a sale. I don't even calculate my paycheck until it's done. You know, I look at it as the process of helping this person to the best of my abilities, no matter what. Um, one of my best referrals and one of my best uh, testimonials came from a client that never actually purchased from me. Wow. We had we had some major hiccups during the very beginning of COVID, and she never was able to actually purchase her home. But she saw that every day. And every moment I worked my butt off to try to make sure that she got everything she needed to get her to that step. And, you know, at the end, it still fell short, but she knew that it wasn't just the sale for me. It was getting her family in a home. Mm -hmm. And even after that, um, I continued to help her to find housing that she could lease until such time as she's able to purchase. So I think, you know, when it really comes down to it, you know, not just working the sale itself, but, you know, being that source for anybody, for anything, um, you know, I've gotten referrals from other agents, right? You know, they've sent me clients. And I think it's just, if you can show people that, you know, I genuinely do care about the people that are in front of me, I think that they will naturally kind of help you through those moments. That's, that's a great piece of advice of, of being able to, to make that connection with people and, and them being your best marketing, your best advertising tool, because it's almost cliche to be to say things like, oh, yeah, you know, you, you treat people right and you do the right things and, and people are going to be the best, you know, your best advertising, that, that word of mouth thing. It, it is cliche in the fact that it's been heard a lot, but it's also very true. And in order to be a cliche, there has to be a certain amount of truth to it. And is that what you found? Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, and I can't speak for everybody, but I know you and I are kind of on that Gen X and, and we, I think everybody kind of models themselves somewhat after millennials. And I know millennials get a lot of grief, but, you know, millennials set a lot of trends too, because, you know, where do most of us do our shopping online? What do we do when we're shopping online? We look at the reviews. And so I think that, you know, the best anybody can do is to give you a referral or a review um, because everybody's going to look at that. Even if, even if they weren't referred to you, you know, when you go to look at, you know, go look for a new TV, first thing you do, you're going to Google reviews. Yes. You know, you're going to see, you know, how are other people having the experience with this brand, with this particular model? Um, and so I think the same thing goes with any tradesmen, salespeople, anything like that. 
you want to know that the person you're using or the, the product or service or brand that you're going to select has a good reputation. And I think that that comes from more than just, you know, the amount of sales that you do. I think it comes from the amount of heart that you have in your sales. Yes. Uh, you, you talking, it, it reminds me of a statement uh, that my wife's reminded me of many different times is that people do business with people that they know they like and they trust. If Absolutely. You, if you, you know, if you don't hit one of those three, you know, posts on the stool, it's a wobbly relationship and it's very simply going to just fall over at some point in time. And that that's what it seems like you put into place in your business and in your practices. I think it's an ongoing process. Okay. I will never say it's a hundred percent. Um, cause there's all, I'll, I always like to feel like I always have room for improvement and I'll, I want to learn every day. Right. That's great. Um, so switching gears a little bit, uh, you're, you're wearing a bow tie today. And that kind of goes into my next question is, uh, you're known as the bow tie house hunter. How did you wind up with that name? So that came about, you know, as I said, I started in the car business. Um, I was in the car business for 15 years. One of the, areas I spent most of my time in the car business was at Chevrolet. Um, and Chevrolet, during the summers, we could wear polos, you know, we could wear, you know, whatever. But during the winter, fall and winter months, you had to wear a shirt and tie. Well, as the dealerships grew and you had, you know, 24 salespeople on the floor, I wanted something that would differentiate me from everybody else. And so I started wearing a bow tie. Um, as you know, Chevrolet's emblem is the bow tie. Yes. And so it kind of caught on from there. And then I started customizing the bow ties on my own personal vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I changed the color. My wife had a black Suburban with a purple one. I had a black Suburban with a red one. Um, you know, my sister had a white Impala with a teal one. And so we just, I started doing that. And then customers started asking for it. So I kind of became the bow tie guy at the dealership. Mm -hmm. Well, I decided you know, clip-ons just weren't going to work for me. I just... <laughs> Because I knew anybody could wear a clip on. Yeah. So, you know, I honestly went on YouTube and I searched up how to tie a bow tie. And I probably watched 100 videos. And I sat at my desk in my spare time just, you know, trying to tie bow ties. And I finally got it. And I got it to a point where I could do it literally blindfolded. Um, and so when I started in real estate, it was one of those things. I wore a bow tie to the first interview that I went on to look at brokerages. Right. And everybody was like, man, I really love the bow tie. And I was like, I got to find a way to incorporate this into it. And so, you know, we started playing around with different algorithm algorithms and different things. And, you know, the bow tie house hunter just kind of came about. And mm -hmm. uh, so I wear a bow tie anytime I have first meeting, um, closing, anything like that. And so it's just kind of that thing. Even my sweatshirts, you know, they have the bow tie house hunter on them and a bow tie somewhere. Nice. Okay. So it sounds like you may be even coming up with your own line of bow ties in the future. Uh, it's definitely in the works. Okay. Um, yeah, it's definitely in the works. It's something that uh, I, I really do have a passion for because a lot of people just, they can't, they act like they can't do it. And I'm like, if you can tie a Windsor knot, you can tie a bow tie. Yes. It, it, it seems like you went through a lot of work though to, <laughs> to be able to get to the point where you, where you are right now is like, I can tie it in my, with my eyes closed because I remember going through and learning how to tie a Windsor, you know, full Windsor, half Windsor, you know, all the different knots on a regular tie. The bow tie seems a, not more complicated, just a little different type of thinking goes into to getting it correct and, and I'll say what's the word aligned is maybe the right word. Yeah. And, and I've learned, I, I try not to make them look too perfect mm -hmm. because then people think it is a clip on. So uh -huh. if I leave one side a little bit, you know, a little bit slag or a little bit here, then, uh, you know, people realize it's, it's a real bow tie. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's a great one. That's a that's a good uh, piece of advice for people. If you're into the bow ties, it's like just leave it a little bit off, just yeah, so people know it's bit. it's a real tie. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now the other part of the name is the house hunter piece of it. In my mind, when I when I think of a house hunter, I'm like, okay, so are you out there, you know, tracking houses? And please forgive the 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 thoughts. Um, I I think back to my days of Bugs Bunny. 
you know, Yosemite Sam and all of those different types of things. It's like, shh, I'm hunting rabbits. That's what comes into mind when I think about that. Well, the funny thing is, I actually just did a video not too long ago where we actually did that. I had on, you know, like a safari hat and a bow tie and, you know, binoculars and I'm out hunting houses. Um, and, and that is kind of the concept because, you know, anytime you're looking for something, and, and I love, and it's one of the things I love about sales, period, any kind of sales, um, get to know your client. You know, right. if you and your wife came to me and said, JC, we want a house and we want this, I'm going to say, great, we can find that. But I'm going to ask you some some deep, some more detail oriented questions. I'm going to start setting you up where you can like houses and dislike houses uh, on my app so that I can know what things are important to you. And then I'm going to go out and I'm going to start finding houses that may not be exactly what you said you wanted, mm -hmm. but they'll fit all the criteria that you've told me. Mm -hmm. And it's and sales is about listening. Um, it's about finding out, you know, the unspoken things that are important to people. And then, right. you know, the things that are going to help them not just right this minute, but in the future as well, mm -hmm. you know. If I know, hey, you've got a kid on the way and you're just starting your family, then that three bedroom may be OK right this minute. Right. But in two years, it may be too small. Right. Um, so we may want to look at a four bedroom, you yeah. know, in that same in that same range, things like that. Um, and then the other thing is, yeah, I do literally ha house hunt <laughs> um, in my market area. I try to stay in the in the know. Um, so every morning I get up. And I check the new listings. I see what hit the market in my zip codes. Right. Um, if it's a house that I'm not familiar with, I usually take a day and I ride out and I go look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's empty, I'll, you know, I'll go tour it by myself. Right. Just so I have an idea of what's in the market. So when someone says, hey, I'm looking for this, I can say, hey, I know exactly where one of those is. Come on with me. Right. Okay. And uh, and really find it qu quickly and efficiently. Um, I think it makes a better use of everybody's time, but I also think it helps people to not fall into that. Well, he sold me this house, but it really doesn't work for me. Right. That's a, that's a good kind of mindset of, of being able to, to, to take that, the, the analogy of hunting and, and knowing, okay, what it is you're looking for, all the different criteria and and being able to to put those th pieces into place and i noticed you said on on, on your app and you, you know the different criteria come up you can see different houses you know i like this one i like that one and for some strange reason i was like oh well, it's almost like a um a tinder for house hunting type of thing it's like hey yes I'll swipe left if you like it swipe right if you don't type of thing it, and it really is it, it really is, um, you know, just hit the thumbs up or the thumbs down mm -hmm. and, you know, it's going to notify me and I, I can look at it and say, OK, well, you know, they don't like this style, um, even though this, you know, might fit the criteria. It's just that style just doesn't appeal to them. Mm -hmm. And so it does help. Um, it helps me kind of narrow the focus to, to better serve my clientele. Oh, right. that, that's great to be able to have something like that and to be able to use all the different pieces of information to be able to help find, help somebody find what it is that they're looking for in the process. Now you, in my research on you and, and having a, a relationship with you, I know that you're a certified uh, defense instructor. Now, how did you get started with self-defense? So my self-defense training came from a couple of different things. Mm -hmm. You know, as a kid, I think all kids experience some level of bullying or anything like that. Um, I grew up in some pretty rough areas. Um, my childhood was spent between East Orange and Newark, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and Gary, Indiana, and Chicago. Um, and so those were some rough areas to kind of be a kid. And a lot of a lot of my time, I was a latchkey kid, right. you know, back in the 80s, 90s, you know. Parents were, you know, yes. you had a key around your neck and yes. you literally come home and I had to take care of my little brothers. Okay. And so my my parents put me in martial arts. Um, and so I had I, I developed a passion for it. I like martial arts. My older brother was a boxer um, and my family is all in law enforcement mm -hmm. and uh, my family owned a security company. And so it's ironic because when I met my wife, 
her family is into martial arts. Her brother owns several Taekwondo schools and is a career martial artist. That's mm -hmm. his profession. Right. Um, so what we did was we combined the two areas, mm -hmm. my security background and my security company with their martial arts school. And so he and I traveled and taught martial arts and self-defense to the guards. Mm -hmm. And so even the armed guards and the unarmed guards, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, there's a level of, hey, this gun works great and it's it's great tool, but it's not going to help you in every situation. If you don't have it or if it gets taken away from you, what do you do now? Right. Um, and so we just kind of combined the two. And then from there, civilians started asking for training. Mm -hmm. And so we started working with domestic violence victims. Mm -hmm. And from there, you know, it just kind of kept growing and growing and growing. Um, now it's never been something that I've done full time because it's not, you know, it's not as lucrative unless you're you have a school where you're teaching children every day. Yeah. Um, but it's something that I'm still passionate about and I still do um, on a volunteer basis more so. Oh wow, that's interesting because you know I I remember those times being a latchkey kid myself and you know you get home. You know, you, parents always told you, you know, get home, unlock the door, go in the house, lock the door, and then call us once you got home. <laughs> Just <Right. laughs> And, you know, knowing some of the different areas you talked about growing up in, and especially during those times, I can understand the the need to, to be able to protect yourself, to defend yourself, and having, you know, brothers and things like that. There's always that, that need, and, and being able to take that in and do something positive with it. Not just saying, Oh, well I learned it just to protect myself and being able to say, okay, no, here's a way that I can take some of the things that I've learned, you know, different, again, another connection, you know, your wife, her brother, and, and being able to marry the, the two things together and have something that, that provides a level of defense for somebody and some, a sense of security, not just in the physical sense, but in the mental sense, because, you know, understanding, self-defense it's not just okay i can do these things it's a matter of okay i understand it's a mindset switch and and being able to to share that with people as well yeah absolutely um i took a personality quiz just recently and uh that developed it said that i was an advocate and the advocate personality is one that looks to stand up for others mm -hmm. And I said, oh, yeah, I think that that really does play into me um, because I think all things being equal, if if things would have been different, I probably would have gone into law enforcement as well, mm -hmm. just because I love helping people. I love serving people. And so, like you said, that mindset of, hey, this person now is better off because I showed them something just kind of sits well with me. Mm -hmm. That's, that, that's great being able to to do that. And it, and it sounds like even in your current careers, that's that's the the emphasis uh, that pushes you to to provide that service for people and, and seeing how, OK, well, you know, they're looking for a home. OK, how can I provide them, you know, the, the opportunities to see a home that's going to fit their needs or even as we talked about earlier in affordable housing and being involved in that and, and being that advocate for people in those situations where it's like, hey, I need housing, but I need to be able to to make that step into it and in, in finding that for people. So that's that's a great m match in terms of your personality and, and what it is that you're doing with your your skills and, and your ability. That's great to hear. <clears throat> So with all of this diversity of backgrounds and things, it, it seems like uh, it's almost like the, the, the pieces have meshed, you know, the, the self-defense piece, uh, the sales piece. Do you see that the, the two overlap in terms of, you know, the self-defense that you've learned and, and that you've trained in? And then on the sales side, have you seen the two overlap, you know, in both directions? Oh, absolutely. Because um, anytime you're offering a service, you have to sell yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I think even in the self-defense training, my sales training has helped me to be able to market that and get it out there. Um, and then vice versa. In sales, every customer and every client is not going to be a patient, kind, loving person. Um, I've run into some, you know, some folks that walk in and, you know, immediately walk in the door ready to fight and i mean you know ready to fist fight over something that may have nothing to do with us um 
but learning to, you know, de-escalate those situations, but also having the confidence in myself to know, okay, I can size this person up. And if I need to take him down, I need to do it this way. Right. Um, it helps me to stay calm in those situations. Um, and it's funny because I, I look at my son, my oldest son, and, uh, he has that demeanor times 10, you know, he just looks at things and he's like, I know I can beat him. So I'm just not worried about it. I mean, he can talk all he wants. And so it's funny to me, but you know, I look at it and I go, well, I know without that training, I wouldn't be in that mindset that, mm -hmm. you know, Hey, this is not a big deal. This guy's not really a threat. And, right. you know, being able to assess that threat is key because you don't want to overreact because then you cause that situation to expound to become way worse than it should be. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. There's plenty of times where I've seen a situation escalate into something. It didn't need to be just because one person didn't know how to deescalate. And I, I'll even throw myself in there. It was like where I didn't deescalate, not because I didn't know how it was just because I was like, Oh, you want to step on my toes right now? I'm going to step back even harder. But, you know, just to throw myself out there and not to be like, oh, yeah, other people. No, I, I've done it myself and been that hard-headed guy where it's like, and walk away and be like, why did you do that? You didn't need to make, you know, make this more than what it was. But, <clears throat> again, I think I we're all guilty. <laughs> uh, I think ego plays a big part in it. You know, yeah. the male ego is a dangerous thing. <laughs> Um, cause I, I've done it before. Um, but you know, I've also learned to walk away. Yes. Um, you know, and I'm fortunate cause a lot of times when I'm in those situations that people like you around me who are a little bit, you know, when you're outside looking in, you're a little bit more level headed. So I, I, I remember times where you were like, Hey, you should go that way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yes. Having that relationship and having somebody to be able to, you know, to sit on your shoulder and just be like, Hey, just it's okay. It's, it's all good. It's not worth it. Right. Just go on about the business. It, it, we'll laugh about this later and, <laughs> and, and, and having those opportunities. I think, um, I want to say thank you again, JC, for taking the time out, to, um, to just talk with us and, and share some of the different things that you've been through your different experiences and, and how you're currently helping people in, in the market right now. Do you have um, a way that people can contact you, a website or anything like that that you can share with the audience that they can uh, reach out to you if they're interested in, whether it's a house or even possibly a car? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a website. It's the Bowtie, well, BowtieHouseHunter.com. Um, quick and easy. You can get me there. Um, anytime you're looking for me, you can find me on Facebook um, under J.C. Moore or J.C. Moore Realtor. Um, just search me there, Instagram. I'm under Bowtie House Hunter. Um, and you know, anybody can message me, call me for advice, questions, anything like that. Okay. All righty, JC. Again, I want to say thank you for your time. It's been a real pleasure and a great time to, to catch up and, and talk about some of your different experiences and, and share them with the audience about, Hey, how you've been able to progress in your career. So I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us this week uh, on the Business Leader Spotlight. Please enjoy the show. Thank you.